So social enterprise, I'm guessing that was a deliberate choice to go down that route. Yes, it is. Um, nonprofits, their funding is very streamlined. Okay. Uh, when they apply for a grant, that there's basically only line items that they can do. A social enterprise works really well with a nonprofit because what it does is it brings in a different stream of money that can be utilized on many different aspects, not just what the government wants. Okay, so you have a little bit more freedom. Yeah, I have a lot more of choice freedom. there. And how long ago did you start New Directions? Uh, January 2nd, 2012. We just celebrated our 10th year in business. Wow, congratulations. The best part about all that is nobody's copied me. Why do you think that is? Because I do the jobs that nobody else wants to do. That's a good way to put it, right? Yeah. I feel like that is tied to the homeless problem as a whole. People would rather just turn their head to it. Or throw money at it and think it's going to go thrown away. a lot of money at it. Thrown, we've thrown a lot of money at it because the government th has lots of money and they decide what they're going to do to end homelessness, which is primarily housing, which is... A novel idea. If you can build enough housing, have enough housing where you can put people into, that's wonderful. But the housing stock's not there. And you can't build housing fast enough to, to house the people. As you house people, 60, you have 120 becoming unhoused. The, the math isn't there. It's not going to work. So what do you think we should be focusing on? Because that's the big push, right, is housing. That's where everybody's yeah. focus is at right now. Housing is good, but we need to transition. Uh, like the individuals I work with are the ones that we pushed into out of sight, out of mind. Uh, so they're hidden. They're not causing a problem right now. So we'll just kind of like leave them alone. And those individuals don't work out well in housing, taking them out of the marsh after five years and putting them in an apartment. They still have learned behaviors from being homeless in survival mode. Most of the homeless out there, we think, are sitting around a campfire roasting marshmallows. Basically, they're in survival mode. They're stealing whatever they can to survive. They're going into the stores, stealing whatever they can to survive. Um, and then we have the drug addiction and the mental health. And you combine all that together and it gets kind of cloudy, you know, as far as what should we be doing. New Directions... We go into the homeless encampments, the ones you can't see from the road. And we work with those individuals where I get all my employees from. So we clean up the environment, which is my primary focus because we have to have something to hand down to our children. And right now, it's not pretty. You, yeah, it's not a great sight. Yeah, you can't really go too many places. Uh, today, we picked up a little over 800 syringes and disposed of probably almost two tons of trash. This is from two different locations, not multiple locations, two set locations, one right off of Valley West and one in McKinleyville right off of Central. And these areas are out of sight, out of mind until they cause problems. And then when they cause problems, law enforcement comes in, chases them to a new area and leaves this horrific mess. And nobody touches that. There's nobody in Humboldt County that goes in there and cleans it up. You have great organizations like Pack Out Green Team, River Life Foundation, or number two, one and two, my favorites. And what they do is they're, I call them the weekend warriors. They go out on the weekends and they do a great job with what they do. Uh, both of those individuals, the head people are my friends and we talk all the time. Um, but, you know, we got to kind of get out of way from the out of sight, out of mind. And, and kind of like, okay, out of sight, I understand. Out of mind, never. So the whole idea of trying to transition people that have been homeless for five to 10 years into housing is, is crazy and, and really doesn't work well. But what if we transitioned them to smaller camps? Like we don't want them camping in this area because they're causing problems, maybe a fire or something. How about if we move them to another place that's structured campground? Let them get their feet under and let them start feeling trust again. The trust level isn't out there. The belief that anybody wants to help these individuals, if you talk to any of the homeless, if you bring a law enforcement officer, of course, you get a different story. But if you actually go in there and talk to them as one-on-one, -on -one, and that's the reason why I imply, uh, employ the homeless, is because they're our peers. They're the ones that can connect faster to the homeless individuals that are out there. 
So my idea would be to transition, transition from places we don't want them to places we do want them that are healthier areas where our, our public health and mental health can walk in without law enforcement. Right now, we have the MIST program, great program, but the reason why MIST was created is because mental health people can't walk into these homeless encampments by themselves. What is the MIST program? The MIST program, <clears throat> excuse me, is a, a program set up with law enforcement and mental health. And they go in trying to work with uh, the severely mentally ill homeless population that we have out there. Uh, whether it's drug-induced or coexisting diseases, it, it, it's still out there pretty pre prevalent. And so um, the county doesn't let their employees or city employees don't can't go into these areas without law enforcement. That's just a safety precaution? Yes, it's a safety precaution. Although I've been doing this for 25 years and I'm still here um, and I haven't had anybody try to attack me. And if they did... The other homeless people that are working with me are understanding what we're doing. It doesn't, it, it's never happened. Usually my guys go into camps and go housekeeping and we, we actually get a chuckle and then they come out of their tents and we talk and it's a real conversation, you know, and I think that's part of my job that I like the most. Um, we do other jobs like landscaping and stuff, but walking into these forgotten places is, is kind of where my my whole history is. Now, when you go in and clean out one of those places, is there somewhere like an intermediate housing situation where they could go that you pointed to that idea of another camp where they could be moved? Is there an example of that or has that been implemented successfully anywhere? No. And it doesn't seem like anybody wants that to happen. Um, I've actually suggested that if they help me with a location, um, New Directions would actually flip the bill the porta potties, the trash sanitation, all that stuff, we would actually provide the security, uh, the case management. And unfortunately, no, we don't want to do that. Um, Why do you think that is? You know, that's the million dollar question. Um, I wish I had that answer. Um, for one, they don't believe it'll work because there's a lot of people that are vested with housing that doesn't want that. If that's a lower tier, uh, nobody's making money off of it. Nobody's going to make money off a campground, but you are going to make money off of a permanent supportive housing or temporary supportive housing. You know, we got, um, what, Danco uh, looked for $19 million to convert the, the Red Roof Inn into permanent supportive housing for the homeless, and then they had to ask for more millions of dollars you got the days in over there at Valley West that there's another million dollar project. Um, hell, we have this one place right there on Fifth Street that was converted from an old hotel into a newer hotel. And that was only done like three years ago. And now it's being totally gutted out and remodeled again because there's more funding stream for permanent supportive housing, temporary housing. Um, there's no money in campgrounds. And Unfortunately, I believe that's the missing piece. There's a continuum of care that we need to progress through, and we just want to join, jump from A to F and then go up from there. Yeah, I think that's a big point, right? Is if you do this intermediate housing, people have to accept, oh, it's not just cut and dry. We can move them out and everything's going to be okay. It's a, it's a multi-stage process of, okay, we have to move them first out of this place where we don't want them, where they're causing some problems into this other spot, and then from there we can move them maybe into a more permanent housing Maybe spot. into Betty's Container Village and stuff. I, yeah. That's the next progressive movement. You know, um, even Betty will tell you, taking some people from just straight out of the marsh without going to detox or any of that stuff, it's a little bit more challenging in her, even in her Container Village. You know, but say we had a, a cool-off place. You know, hey, we don't need you over here because this is – bothering the seniors and stuff like that um we do locations that have bothered apartment buildings uh silvercrest we have camps all around silvercrest right across the street from uh salvation army down the hillside right next to an apartment building right next to open door clinic and these people have been allowed to been down there for a long time and now we've gone down there talk to them um Unfortunately, the key question is, is where can we move them 
you know, right now we're the nice guys, but they still have to move and they're just finding another place. Now, when you guys go in there to move them out, are you going with law enforcement or is it just your team? I absolutely do not. It's just you? It's just me. Unless we have a interaction that's more of the negative side, we don't use law enforcement. Is that just because when they're around, it just instills a different no, temperament? Um, if you look at CSET and the ranger they have in Eureka, he has a very good understanding about the homeless population and we work very well together. We work side by side, but when I walk into a homeless encampment, say he's been called out and he'll say, hey, John, you know, check this out and stuff, and we'll walk into a camp, he'll actually let me take the lead and let me talk to the homeless population first. And he'll stand right there and agree with me and stuff. So there's a a better line of communication now between law enforcement and us than ever has been in before, and I thought we had it good before, you know. Um, walking in into a homeless encamp with a law enforcement officer is saying you've done something bad. And I don't believe that in most cases, we don't even know the people that we're walking into these camps with. So why would I even do that? You know, we walk in most of the time we're greeted with smiles. They come out and talk to us, tell us why they're there, you know, um, and, and it's a better feeling. You know, when you walk in with a cop, it's already stigmatized. You know, cops basically are needed for bad people. And if we walk into every single homeless encampment with a cop, we're immediately saying that we don't trust you and we're scared of you. And we're not. And like I said, I've been doing this for 20-something years now. Um, The last, going on almost 11 years now as a business. And I've never needed that. Now there is comes a time because everybody that works with us and hires us knows that there is no magic wand that I have in my back pocket. So I need time to work with the individuals that are out there. So if we walk into a homeless encampment, it's not like, okay, you got to move by tomorrow. Da, da, da. Uh, it's not even a three day notice. It's like, Hey, you know what? We're going to come back later on this week, talk with you, see what's going on. And, and we kind of like build a plan with them. You know, and the plan means is basically you have to move. You know, this is somebody else's property and there's been enough disturbance here where you have to go. And um, most of them understand that and they just move on. The ones that um, passive aggressive, they, oh, yeah, John, no problem, da, 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 but they're there. And then after two weeks, something's got to happen. And that's when I'll call law enforcement. Hey, you need to come in and talk with them also. And then do they forcibly remove that person? No. They they ask them to move on. And um, between us and the law enforcement, they usually move. Um, we've had one case over there at Valley West where there was a big homeless encampment. And up until two weeks ago, there was probably seven camps down there. Pretty lively. And um, I come back today and... They're all gone. The camps are still there. The people are all gone, and they've destroyed the area. In other words, we had it kind of managed to where we were going down there collecting trash on a weekly basis, and the people would bag up their trash and bring it out, and we'd collect it and take it up the hill. And and everybody was, okay, out of sight, out of mind. Eh, you're not out of my mind. I know where you're at. I'm going to get your trash because that's bad for the environment. And they worked with us. But something happened. We haven't figured it out yet, but it was a massive gone. Everybody gone at one time, except for two people who were telling me a story. But stories are stories. Um, everything has m- multiple sides. You know, what they seen and what actually happened could be different. So I don't really go into that. Um, I do my own investigation. I, I like to pay attention to what we're doing. We take befores and afters pictures. We pay attention to people's personal property. That's organized possessions. I don't care if it's a pile of dirty clothes. If it's a pile of dirty clothes in one place, that's somebody's personal property. You know, we have to understand that. Um, Walking into homeless encampments is like walking into somebody's home for me. And, And now you have to respect that. Even though they're in somebody, they could be in your backyard, you know, but as long as they've been there, 
I have to consider it their home and look at it that way. But um, the different approaches mean different things to us. You know, having needles all piled up in one pile for us is one thing. But when they have to forcibly be moved, which I think that's what happened in this one location, everything was scattered. You know, today we picked up almost 800 and some 820 syringes and almost two tons of trash. That's a lot. Yeah. That's because this is stuff that they were hiding in their tents and stuff like that, that when they had to leave, they just threw it everywhere. Yeah, it's not it's, a pretty sight. It's interesting hearing you have this compassion towards them because I think most people do not – they're not necessarily not compassionate towards the homeless. They're more indifferent or they view them as a nuisance. And hearing you say, you know, I don't want to bring a cop around because that it, that entails that they're doing something wrong. I would imagine most people would say, well, they are doing something wrong. They're illegally camping. They're leaving all this trash. They're – it's drug use there's all of these problems attached to that and you you kind of seem to separate that from them well you got to really look at okay trash let's look at that even going a poor person going to the food bank you get a lot of stuff that you have to cook right you just can't eat pasta out of a bag you know you have to boil it and stuff even top ramen you know so that explains why they have to build little camping fires um the trash if they're giving the ability to dispose of trash, maybe some of them would. You know, in the camp areas that we're working, like in Ferndale and stuff, these guys bag up their trash. We go to their camps, visit them, have a nice conversation with them, take their trash. I don't have the power to make anybody stay or go. But what I do have the power to do is to improve our environment and to prove the communication. I believe most of our community is frustrated because of what they read in the newspapers, what they see on TV, and what politicians say about the homeless population. I think it's frustration. There's nothing we can do about it. Well, there is something we can do about it. We can engage it instead of trying to hide it. And that's kind of where uh, New Directions has taken the lead. There's a reason why we were put here. And my homeless, my homeless employees get frustrated. Because we clean multiple sites and then we may have to go back a month or so because the landowner doesn't want to pay us to monitor those sites to, to break the cycle of homelessness. So what happens is we clean it up just like everybody else does and go away and they just move right back in. The whole idea of what New Directions does is we go in, clean out the site, but we monitor it. We got to come back at least once a week to make sure nobody gets reestablished in that site. And what happens when they do is we tell them, hey, guys, you can't do it. But if you catch them before they get set up, they're really easy to work with. Okay, John, no problem. And they leave. But if you let them establish for months at a time, in some places, years, there was one place that we cleaned out for all point signs that he refused to notify it, you know, to acknowledge it. And that was between 5th and 6th, right by Renner's card lock. And those camps down there were... Years, years of, of stuff. Code enforcement for the city of Eureka started cleaning up and backed out. Because there was just too much. Too much. Jesus. But New Directions went down there and we pulled out 18,000 pounds of trash. Over 3,000 syringes. You know, we wonder why there's so much syringes out there. Well, we have needle exchange. You know, and... I, I'm i actually a substance abuse counselor, was certified substance abuse counselor, and I believe in harm reduction. And I believe in somewhat needle exchange, but I need, think it needs to be done in a, a more of a, a doctor's office or a clinic, you know, so to speak, instead of um, employing homeless people to go into homeless encampments and hand out syringes. You can't expect an addict to do the right thing with a syringe. You can set up all your little mailboxes out there. You can give them a case. But if you're going to keep flooding them with syringes, you got people that are going to be using more drugs. And that's a major factor right now. Uh, a major factor since 2000. I started noticing a big difference in 2014. A big difference. Uh, I was starting to find, this sounds really terrible, Prior to that, I was finding feces everywhere. 
and very few syringes. 2014, I started finding less feces and more syringes. Now, I find hardly any feces and tons of syringes. I, I, I think the two are coordinated together. I just haven't been able to put yeah, it together. Yeah, I don't together. know. Does, does drug use... Yes, it, it stops you to, It does. Yes. Okay. So... I think some that of that's true. You know, I mean, here again, these are just observations. You know, we actually can go into a site, and I showed my guys how we do this, is that you look at that bottom layer of paperwork that's down there, newspapers, writing stuff. Most of it, some of it has dates on it. You know, you could tell how long a camp's been there, you know, pulling out a piece of paper. Oh, wow, this was 2018. And we're talking 20, oh, this camp's been here for four years. You know, and that exists. It's not like these camps are just popping up. They're, they've been everywhere. And we kind of not thinking about how do we relocate them. We chase them from place to place. That seems like that's the biggest frustration is it's a cycle. You go in, you clean up. There's no next step. So they move to another spot and it just repeats. You go back in, you clean up. They move to another spot. Yeah, You go back in, you clean up, they move to another spot. Why can't we move them to a designated spot that we can oversee? You know, I'm willing to do that. I'm willing to put New Directions liabilities on the line. I have insurance company that's willing to do that. But if you talk to a, a city, um, um, city personnel... Well, you have to have this, 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 this. I'm going, wait a minute. Right now, they're currently camping everywhere, and there are nothing. There's no safeguards. So why don't we set up a makeshift area where we can control it, and we could put some safeguards in there? You know, right now, you have the same amount of camps out there that are just, it's kind of like the old Wild West. You ever see those stories where, oh, this guy was snoring, so I just walked over his bed and shot him? You know, the, actually out there in the Martian forest, I would be scared to sleep at night. I would sleep during the daytime. Um, you don't know who's your friends out there, and somebody that needs a fix and stuff is not your friend. They'll steal whatever you have. Is it pretty dangerous in those camps? Or in those camps, is it people that are kind of looking out for each other or everybody's on their own? You're just staying together? No. Um, some camps stay isolated. And then sometimes you'll find groups. But usually the isolated camps, as soon as somebody finds out you're camping in this area and you're getting away with it, they start moving in. They may not move right next to your tent, but 25 yards away, they'll set up. Because if you're not getting bothered, I'm not going to get bothered. Um, as far as feeling threatened... In any camp, I have not felt threatened walking into any camp um, at all. And I, I'm 64 years old. I pretty much can't. Just went through open heart surgery and a hip replacement. I'm not going to defend myself very well. Um, but are you going in by yourself or do you have your crew there with you? We, we, when we're going into new areas, we minimize our crew. So it's smaller crew, three to four people. That's interesting. I would have thought you'd take more people. No. Because it's a safety thing. No. If you bring in more people, you're you're overwhelming the individual, and you'll get a behavior that you not necessarily like. But if you go in with smaller amounts of people, then it's more like a greeting party than an, um, we're coming here to harass you party. It's a little more friendly. Yes. It, it's, it's changing. You got to change the attitudes before you can change the behaviors. That's our motto. You know, we change the attitudes that change the behaviors in our community. So if you go in with the right attitude, the behaviors are nullified. Now, is there a lot of violence, though, in those camps? Most of the violence I've seen in the homeless population is with themselves. It's not so like, a homeless person committing it against another homeless yes, person. Yes. You don't I, you don't see too much where the homeless person is actually jumping out of the bushes and attacking somebody and stuff. In some cases, you do. Uh, the mentally ill ones um, are pretty much the, the biggest culprit of that one. They're the ones like we had an interaction today with uh, at Ray's Food Place. This guy was just totally out of it. Whether it was drugs or mental health, I didn't know him, so I couldn't judge it. But he was definitely not dealing with anything on this planet at that point in time. Yeah, he was not aggressive, 
but very loud and belligerent to where the security had to escort him off the property. But it's it's not generally the homeless population is just like you and me sitting here. Um, I've spent so much time working with them. I have not found anybody that's a threat to me. Um, I'm not special. I'm just like you are. It's just my temperament of how I go in with respect. Um, I have no desire to move anybody or have them stay. But I do have a desire is you got to talk with me. And, and after the conversation, we'll go from there. Do you think that safety aspect comes from just your time around them? Because I've walked down, I mean, even here in Old Town, and it's dark, and you see some homeless people walking around, and they're on something, and you get a little, okay, I should watch out, just be careful. I don't know if that's warranted or not. I've never had a bad interaction with a homeless person, but I've been well, on edge. Walking down any alley in the dark... I don't care if it's a homeless person or whatever. Yeah. Um, It's always a dangerous thing. So do you think it's easier where you're going into their territory? You're kind of on their turf? Yeah. I I believe it is. And I believe um, after doing it this long, most people know who I am or at least heard about me. Um, I still have people, you know, complaining about me to me. And I'm like, well, did you ever actually see him do that? Oh, yeah, I seen him walk out of the stuff, and I'm sitting there going, okay. It's me. Me. My guys are going like this. I'm going, no, give him his space, you know? But, um, yeah, it's it's a different kind of temperament that we have. That's the reason why I only employ the homeless, because there's nobody knows the homeless better than the homeless. We find camps, because I do work with the homeless, that nobody else would ever possibly find until it got too late. That... That that's an interesting idea of using like working with them to solve the problem, right? Absolutely. That's the key to this. Working with the homeless instead of telling them how we're gonna fix them. Helping them fix themselves. Um, I don't give out tents or sleeping bags or anything. What I do is I give you a good conversation and I'll give you employment. I'm gonna help you work your way out of this through teamwork. See Employment is a a great aspect to start building um, employment readiness. Any kind of business, except for maybe you sitting there working by yourself, but for most businesses, you're working as a team. One person has to hold up the other person. You know, we work in areas around the homeless where we have big items we have to carry out and you can't do it by yourself. So you have to rely on the other person carrying their weight. So you're you're establishing a new concept because homelessness is isolation regardless of whether you're sitting in a tent with somebody. You're still isolated. You have that sense of isolation. So what we want to do is that any one of these guys, these eight people that are working with you today, are your, your buddy. They are all willing to help. All you have to do is call out. And that changes the person's mindset. Well, I'm not doing this all by myself. I actually have some help. Somebody does care. You know, uh, the first thing I do when people start to want to work for me and stuff is I never hire anybody on the first, oh, I want to work for you. Yeah, you know, you, you can panhandle and get what you need. If you really want to work for me, then in two days we'll be back to this location. You come here and we'll talk again. Individuals that I hire, I buy them boots. I buy them gloves. Um all the things that they need to do to be safe. In a little over 10 years of employment, I've had three workmen's comp claims and they've been bee stings. Um, so I take Which care of Which is impressive because you guys are working with a lot of stuff. Oh my God. The Caltrans has declared all homeless encampments hazmat worthy. What a waste of money. There's nothing hazmat worthy. Biological, but then public health says syringes aren't biohazard anymore so it, how does that work you'd have to ask them that question. they said that they're not it's not a biohazard no nope, syringes about are not a biohazard they're STDs actually telling or community members STDs, to go around and pick them up STDs, but you go around and tell a customer you 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 tell your community members carry a hazmat box or put them in a, a bottle and stuff and just pick them up be careful you don't get poked though me, myself, what's on the outside of a syringe is just as deadly as what's getting poked because hep C can stay alive on just about anything for months. And that's a problem here in Humboldt County, right? Absolutely. 
You know, the whole idea of giving needles out as needed, as many as they want, is to reduce that in AIDS. If you check your stats, it hasn't done either. So why are we still handing out syringes such as with Hatcher and stuff? And, and the worst part about that, the needle exchange, is they're not doing it. They're having the homeless out there doing it. So you have uncertified, unpredictable people that were addicts handing other addicts syringes. But doesn't that, isn't that kind of ironic you pointing that out where they're working with people in their field that do it? So addicts helping addicts, you're working with homeless helping the homeless. Yes, but there's a difference. My guys aren't on drugs. They're thinking with a rational mind now, a clear mind now. So you pull them off. You're harm reduction, Absolutely. but you make them stop using work. <laughs> you, can't, you, you can't work for me and be high. I am a business. Um, there, there's definite rules, you know, uh, I've had people that are IV users and they've been gone through detox and they've come out and they've survived just well. Um, I've had people that are meth heads and you know what, they, they come out okay and it worked well. Alcohol is a ready supply. Right now I'm dealing with potheads. <laughs> Everybody in the world smokes pot now and it's a cool thing, but when you're working, you can't do that. So people know that what I do for a living, I've talked to each and every one of them. And if you want the job with me, you, you basically, what you do on your own time is what you do on your own time. But when I pick you up at seven o'clock in the morning, you better be ready. And you got to be ready until we get done, which is around three o'clock in the afternoon. So if you can make it between those two times, eh, maybe new directions will employ you. But if you can't be honest with yourself, because the guys on this cruise that have worked so hard to stay sober, stay clean and stuff is, is wonderful. The idea of giving out syringes, the homeless, giving other homeless syringes, the problem with that is that they haven't been separated from their addiction long enough. So what are exactly they doing? You know, that, that's the biggest issue. When I use my peers the peers of the homeless to interact with the other peers. It's in a very positive atmosphere. There's no drugs involved. There's no drinking or partaking in that, but you're actually with syringes handing somebody, in my opinion, an unloaded gun and telling them to find the bullets. If you cared so much about what they were doing, why don't you give them the stuff that goes in the syringe also so that way they won't get fentanyl. Maybe they won't overdose if you give them the right dosage. There is an argument for that. Yeah. I do like your approach in the sense that you are, you're providing them with a view of how life could be, that they could get sober, they could find employment. You're almost dangling like the carrot out and saying, hey, you could have this. You just have to take these steps and you're going to be okay. And you're right, Hatcher, it's more of a, a level playing field. Hey, I'm still using. Here's a needle. You can keep using. I'm not going to stop you from using. And hopefully you're going to want to get sober at one point. If you want to. But my understanding from them is that that's not their mission is to try to get you sober. It's just to help you do it in a clean way. And not get HIV or. Yeah, or not HIV. spread. Yes. Any of those diseases. Yeah. It, that to me, you're keeping somebody stuck right where they're at. In most cases with me, when you, you said that thing about the employment and stuff, They've already had a history. They've had a work history. They've had a family history. But what they've done is gone through a dramatic experience where they've lost that. And, and they, then they start giving up hope and then faith that nobody cares anymore. So when somebody comes along that actually shows them kindness and the belief that they can regain their lives, that means the world to them. And that's kind of what I'm happy to be able to be known like that. Well, if you hook up with John in New Directions, he can help you. Help you get to where you need to go, not where I need you to go. You know, um, transitional employment. I, ha I work for 87 different businesses. So I do get businesses calling me and say, hey, John, you got anybody ready for Main Street? And yeah, I do. My guys, uh, I have... Three people work at Wing Inflatable that builds military boats. Oh, that's fantastic. I have um, one gentleman that's a security guard at Blue Lake Casino. 
see, they hadn't damaged their record, their their history that bad where as soon as he was able to regain himself, and he wasn't with me, he had it in him all along. All I did was brush him around, get him dusted off, and gave him the, wow, you're really good, you know? You should be doing something with yourself. And he's security. One is, um, we just did a concert for Blue Lake Casino, and I just found out one of the coordinators, I used to, she used to work for me. It's like, those are the neat things, because sometimes I don't see the after effect of our interactions. Sometimes I do. A lot of them are working in gas stations, you know, liquor stores, uh, convenience stores, um, grocery outlet, uh, Bayshore Mall. I have two janitorial people there now that are, are working for them at the janitorial level. You know, this is the the positive stuff, but they've had it in them all along. All somebody had to do is get them up off the ground, brush them off, and then present them in a different way. I think that's the biggest thing, is you just need someone to believe in you at some point, right? Because if everybody is telling you you're just a piece of shit, this is what you're going to be, this is what your life is, and get used to it, because this is all that there is for you out there. It's all you deserve. It's all you deserve. Yeah. And and I don't think that's any human person out there. Um, you never leave anybody behind. You always give it your best. Sometimes it works out. I mean, I've had people that I've hired that didn't make it through the two-week training period. You know, they they basically got a couple of paydays under them and just got so blasted they couldn't even make it to work again. You know, um, that's why my, my strategy of never hiring anybody that wants to work for me right now, eh, if you want to work for me, you'll come back and meet me. And then if you come back and meet me, hey, now we have something to talk about. Um, I, I've... My new driver, we've been able to diversify it to two crews now. And my new driver came from a RV that was parked on the side of the road. Him and his daughter, um, his vehicle had broken down. He wasn't able to tow it anymore and everything. So he was staggered in one spot. And, you know, people's frustration. I don't want the RV there. And basically, law enforcement was getting ready to do whatever they were going to do, either impound it or whatever. And I talked to the gentleman, and it, that conversation came from the liquor store people that were saying, hey, you need to talk to this guy. He's really a cool guy. So I walked over, tapped on his thing, talked to him, ended up pulling it to the Arcata House Partnerships um, RV, new place that they have out there on Samoa Boulevard, and got him in there. And he's been driving for me ever since. He's got his kid into daycare now. Wow. You know, all I had to do was knock on his door. Those are the stories people don't hear. Yeah. People tend to hear all the bad stuff, and that's what causes the frustration. If if somebody understood and knew that there was something we could really do, maybe somebody would be supportive of it. But as you can see, I don't have too many. Humboldt County Roads is the one governmental agency that supports what we do and they give us areas where the homeless encampments are to, to go work with them. Other than that, why don't the city of Eureka want to work with us? Well, I think I was naive in the beginning around the homeless and that I didn't understand just how much money was being made off of homeless people, especially in the state of California. I don't think people really understand that the homeless industry, it's a business. And people are profiting off of people being homeless. And so if you stop that, if you actually help these people and you get them off the streets and you improve their lives, well, how am I going to make my six-figure salary yeah. if there's no homeless people? I think if you work as a nonprofit and you're actually providing services for the homeless, you should be having a base salary of 40000 And then you actually get more when you actually meet tiers. Um, right now... It, I actually ran a nonprofit for eight years. I know how it works. You get funding in, say, $200,000 because you're going to provide a service for the homeless. Well, 75000 comes right off the top for personnel. So now you have 125000 Well, now we got to sit there and start thinking, well, we need the supplies and stuff. Well, there's another thirty. Well, now you only have $95,000. You started off with two hundred. But see, these grants that come in, it keeps their jobs in the nonprofits going. That's where the money goes. 
nobody pays. There's no pot of money that the nonprofit has earned other than the grants that come in. The grants are covered with personnel uh, costs. Measure Z funds, public health and safety. But if you look at most of the Measure Z funds, they go for personnel to buy to hire more people. I just got turned down and I just wanted safety equipment. I wanted boot enough money for boots so I don't have to pay my own money. I wanted enough money to buy more safety glasses, uh, trash bags, and and all this stuff. And I got turned down. And I'm not sour about it. I was spending my money on it anyway. But it gives me a little bit more ability to buy stuff. Like the last Measure Z money, I was able to get a, a power wagon. And a power wagon is a wheelbarrow that's motorized. Has, I didn't know that was a thing. Has a track system on it. It goes up inclines like this where my guys don't have to kill themselves and and carry stuff up. We that's the reason why we don't get hurt cuz we outthink it. We have portable winches to to haul stuff out of ravines where homeless have been chased to. We have the power wagon. We have now just bought a, a an ATV with another wagon so we can get in further and haul stuff out further. You know, this is why we use that's why our, the public health safety money was critical to us because we're able to buy the better equipment to improve our engagement practices. Very simple. And they wouldn't give it to you? No. I got Do you think it that's because it wasn't for personnel? No. I, I, I Here again, they had better you know things for it. Uh, I'm never going to take away money for a police officer or a fire person or uh, EMT or any of that. We need all those. We need police officers by far and fire people. Um, it's just, you know, the incidental stuff, the, the, the little programs that cities create that are supposed to be pli- uh, doing employment readiness for the homeless, um, where they basically get little buckets and grabbers and go out and, okay, we're going to give you a stipend at the end of the day to pick this up, but, oh, yeah, we've got to hire four other people because the money they give them. Or they could buy a brand new truck with the money they give them. That stuff is not okay. I mean, as far as my opinion is, it's like, okay, then share that money instead of giving that one entity. Not, here again, I, I don't throw names out there, but give that other entity $200,000 and you shut down this one that you know is going out and doing a good job with the homeless and cleaning up all the mess. I don't get it. I mean, I, I would figure the board of supervisors that I know all of them pretty well would jump up and down and say, hey, look, we got to give John that $10,000, you know, let him get some more trash bags and some more boots to protect his guys and stuff. But that hasn't happened. I'm still wait, waiting for that shiny knight to come riding in and save us, you know, but uh, you know what? We just have to do it ourselves. I think that's the approach that it's going to take to actually solve the problem is more people saying that. That we just have to do it ourselves. Yeah. And come together as, I don't know if it's a community level or a city level to try to address it. Because I don't know how it gets fixed otherwise. I've offered city management without pay to show them what we do in the process. They're not interested. Tell me what that's about. I don't know. Uh, some people say it's because I have a big mouth and um, I, I can't keep my mouth shut. If you're doing something wrong, I'm going to tell you you're doing something wrong. If you're doing something right, I'll pat you on the back. Ask my guys. But if they do something wrong, they know they're going to get a lecture. And I think I I rub some of the politicians or the city managers the wrong way when it's like, why can't we do this? And then they put up all these barriers to tell me why I can't. I'm going, none of that exists right now where I'm working. So why can't we try this? And they don't want to try it. Well, we've tried it. Look what happened when we shut down Devil's Playground. That's another one. Devil's Playground was never named Devil's Playground by the homeless. It was a stigma attached to it. When you call a place Devil's Playground, you've actually sent that message that it's evil. Just like this new place we're getting ready to start for Cal Poly. It, the rumor has it it's Anarchy Field. Eh. It's just a big field where the homeless are camping, you know, 
Why do we want to label it? You see what I'm saying? There, there's, we can change anything by just our wording, you know, and, and people don't want to do that. I've offered my services to help people learn what we're doing and nobody has an interest. So I guess I have the market on this business. <laughs> I always thought that Devil's Playground was attributed to the graffiti there. Was it? The, because graf- of the homeless? graffiti down there before they tore down the building was amazing. Yeah. I have pictures of it. Uh, some of that artwork down there, I kept on saying, why tear this down? If you want to make some money, you know, you, you sell this idea that you come in, you whitewash them, and then you rent out squares to the painters. Let them do their artwork. I, I've been trying to get one of them before they tore it down to actually paint this food booth that we do every once in a while at fairs. And I wanted them to do some graffiti on it, kind of symbolizing what New Directions does, but we never got around to it. Yeah, the artwork down there was incredible. It was incredible. Yeah, they should have done something different than just yeah. tear it down. Yeah, it That was, seemed like a waste. The kids actually had um, the kids, kids, community members, kids, were down there in the big what we called the pit. It was the bottom basement of a of a a building. And they had skate ramps down there and everything. And they just had a blast. We sat there and watched them for hours one day. And they were just, you know, had ramps built and the whole shot. But nobody wanted to mention how that was happening. It was all the bad stuff that was happening out there. But do you think the name the Devil's Playground that was attributed to the homeless there, not the graffiti? Yeah. Oh. I yeah. hadn't heard that. It was a stigma. It, 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 you attached the devil's playground to an area where the homeless were camping. So you made it evil. You made it a place you wouldn't want to go. Yeah. And, and truthfully, I've seen lots of people walking through there and everything. We used to go through before the trail was built. We, we were out there way before the trail was built. And we worked for the Cal- California Con- Conservancy. The California State Conservancy, and they own a lot of that out there, and the city of Eureka. At that point, we were working with city of Eureka. That's back when Dave Tyson was the city manager and stuff. And basically, we had the keys to the gate. We'd take my truck and trailer out there. The homeless would fill up shopping carts, lots and lots of shopping carts. And they filled up the shopping carts full of trash. They pushed them out to that little dirt road. We'd drive by, drop my tailgate, load up the six of them, close it up, take it out front, dump it into the the big um, 40-yard dumpster with the lid that we had on it. And we'd dump them in there and take the shopping carts all back to the business owners. It worked out really well. But even at that point, the city didn't, when they, they created a film, the true story of how the trail system was built. We were out there before anybody, and we never even got mentioned in it. So, and we were actually working with all of them. <laughs> and they just left you guys out. Yeah. Uh, so, I, I don't, I, I guess I tend to rub people of power the wrong way. Well, politicians and accountability don't exactly go hand in hand. That's the part where I think I rub the wrong way. Yeah. I want them to be accountable and they just sidestep that. And anytime somebody comes up with an idea to try something, they put so many barriers in your way that somebody like me can't pull it off. You know, how can I afford all the things you're asking me to do, go through the state SECO question? No, no. These guys are already destroying our environment. I just want to take them to an area where we can have them be for a short period of time. And I don't believe that should be the main place in other words that place only exists until you move all these people over here and you get them going and then when they're all going you go to another bad place then you start up another one of those camps right there in other words they're all transitional nothing should be permanent at this level that i work at do you think you'll be able to implement something like that or that something like that will be implemented in the future well or it's just going to be this housing like we're doing right now that's pretty much where it's going right now you you got some people that are trying to work on tiny house villages which once again is permanent housing Um, even if they did get it going which they don't want provide housing for that either Um, unless you're betty chin you're not going to get much housing pats on the back 
me, I was willing to flip the whole bill. If they just gave me a location where I can do it, I would monitor and maintain it, work with law enforcement if they wanted me to. Um, but most important, you know, those people that didn't want to be in this whole homeless mix, those are the people we could save and bring them out of that mix. There may be people that do want to be homeless out there. I've met a lot of them. But there's a lot of people out there that don't want to be there. And we're leaving them there because we just rolled them into a big ball. And and nobody wants to try anything new. I want to do low cost, high impact. Pulling people out of their camps and putting them into another campground that's monitored and maintained with the right set of rules could work. But they won't let me try. Who did you approach with that? Did you go to the city council or the board of supervisors? I went to the city council. I went to the board of supervisors. And they um, just wouldn't give you the land. No. Which is funny because they're now we're trying to what turn parking lots into into housing structures. Yeah, and build more businesses. Why do we need more storefronts when half the storefronts in Eureka are empty? What? Why are you building a building that has more storefronts? Yeah, make that make sense. Uh, that to me doesn't make sense, but. It's all generated by the dollar. You know, with that building money comes payroll money. Don't forget that part. It's there, like you said earlier, there's a lot of money to be made in keeping the problem of homelessness going. What would you say the split is between people that are homeless that don't want to be versus the ones that just want to stay homeless? In my opinion, I'd say 75% of the people don't really want to be out there. 25 I say 75. And and actually I could bring people into places that camps have been and they say we don't want to be here. This we just have no other place to go. Is that because there aren't enough resources for them to get out of that spot or well, what exactly are you looking for resources in order To actually get money, you have to have a diagnosed mental health issue or a substance abuse issue. If you don't have that through mental health or through detox or or a treatment center, then what resources do you have? The single homeless person has the least amount of resources of anybody out there, whether you be male or female. There's not much. That's so funny hearing you say that because the standard trope is, oh, there are plenty of resources for the homeless. They just have to take advantage of them. Yeah, I've (laughs) once again, you're you're not playing with that individual's rules. You're playing with your own rules. I can help you as long as you listen to me and do exactly what I say. And this is where you're going to be and this is what you're going to do. Eh, I'm not buying that. But. Hey, how about if I help you get grounded over here and then we can talk about what you want to do? You know, that's where the conversation should start. The single homeless population, whatever resources are out there available to them, it's only if they sell their soul. What I mean by that, you can't take your dog. You can't take any of your possessions. You're basically coming with me and this is where you're going. I don't know about you. I mean, me, myself, I don't like people telling me what I have to do now. You know? Yeah, but don't you think that at some point some structure like that would be important? Because clearly the choices, or I don't want to say the choices they've made, whatever has happened to them to get them to that point, something's got to change, right? Absolutely. Structure's a, a, a very important thing. You just think it's too structured? Too structured. You know, I structure their homeless in encampments, I I actually help them create a structure there. Hey, you got to bag up your trash. You got to bring it out here. You know, hey, you got to organize your stuff instead of throwing it all around here. How about if you pack it up and you put it in these totes over here? See, so you're already creating structure. I'm just doing it at a different level. I'm not forcing it. I'm basically showing it to them at their level where they're at. Once again, yeah, they've lost everything. Maybe at one point they had everything, and now they lost it. And they don't know how to regain it, and the trust isn't there. Um, 
in the sense that they don't trust if they give up what they're being asked to. Yeah. They'll get something back for yeah. it. Yeah. What are you going to require of me? Sitting in an apartment with two other people and you're going to come in and talk to us every day or, you know, what destruction, what, what are you going to do for me? You're going to just give me a, a, a motel room and that's it. You're going to leave me alone. That doesn't usually happen either. You know, everything comes with a, a cost, the case, case management, substance abuse curating. You know, why don't we get that all out of the way before we try to put them in the apartment? That I agree with. I don't think they should be using drugs and living in those places. Right. I think you should get them So clean. basically it's put them in housing regardless of what their issues are. You see, th- there has to be that transition so they can get some of the kinks out before they get into that apartment. Because I don't know about you, but if... I'm living in an apartment and you're moving in some people that, have, you know, a couple guys from the homeless population that haven't been housed in 10 years. It's not going to go well because, you know, those the homeless population is a lot closer than what people think. They will bond and friends do things for friends. I've seen homeless individuals uh, give their last part of their sandwich to another guy, you know. Um, a person that's newly homeless doesn't have a place to stay and it's raining out, they'll invite them in their tent so they can stay dry. You know, we don't realize that once you give a person an apartment right off, well, they still have friends out on the street. Guess where those friends come to take a shower now? At their apartment. And then after a while, it stops them leaving after the shower and they start, well, can I sleep on your floor for the night? And then they sleep on the floor for the night. Then they'll come back with another friend. Hey, my friend here just needs a shower. And then all of a sudden you have 10, 15 people living in that apartment. And I can't imagine any housing person arguing with that because I know better. Yeah, that's a problem. You can't, especially in a small little room. Yeah, it's a problem. I've had some really good workers that during the virus time, I had to lay them off because of just the whole nature, you know, um, of not wanting to contract anything. And, um, I worked with just the four people that were in one house, you know, the four guys I had already housed in one house and they pretty much isolate all along. Anyway, they just stay together. So I worked with that crew. So I had to lay this one guy off and without our guidance, he was left to just his own recourse. Idle hands. Yeah, and then the friends started coming in and basically ended up getting evicted, and he was the gentleman that was run over by a semi on Broadway. Oh, wow. Yeah, that, that one hurt a lot. Um, each, each and every death from the homeless population hurts a lot because I know a lot of them. And it's like you sit there and go, what could I have done different? You know, I still beat myself about Michael. It's um, it, it, Had I been able to take a chance on him, at that point, you know, and say, okay, you know what? You're going to come with us too. Would he still be alive right now? You know, uh, these are questions I always have to ask, but you know what? We got to start someplace. And, you know, I, I've had many individuals that I've worked with pass away from overdoses to suicide. And um, it never gets any better. So I keep doing this. And I'm going to continue to do it until, yeah, I'm dead. (laughs) Do you feel like it's kind of futile in the sense that it just just stays the same? No. I have eight guys right now. Four of them are brand new. And it doesn't stay the same. They come with different challenges and stuff. It's a nice ringtone. No worries. I usually remember that, but we got into such a good conversation. I, <laughs> I just, I, <laughs> just okay. went right in. I apologize for no, that. No, I just, I mean, futile in the sense that obviously you are making impacts at at a low scale, right? For these yeah. people that you I want to do more. Yeah, but that's the problem, right? Is you, you almost, you can't save everyone. And then at scale, it seems like the homeless problem but, is but only getting worse. What if we had more than just John Shelter in New Directions? Then we could we could start what, about what making real What if we impact. had a whole bunch of these? Not necessarily name it New Directions or anything. I don't care less about that. I, I don't care about getting anything for any helping anybody else get started. 
there's enough out there for everybody. I'm not hurting for work. Actually, I'm overwhelmed with work and people are, can you help me with this? Can you help? It's like, uh, yeah, we will, but I got to put you on a waiting list, you know, because some of these jobs are a little bit more intricate than others. You know, I didn't expect to spend eight hours today on just two jobs, but we had to because it was available and that was the time to do it. But um, it, it gets frustrating because, you know, we're on to something. I mean, the, even the government, they Caltrans, government gave Caltrans a bunch of money to start a work program for the homeless. And they gave it to somebody in Butte County, the Elisha House, and said, oh, you start these work programs up. And we want you to start it in Shasta and Humboldt. Well, our Caltrans people said, well, you know, John and New Directions, they've always helped us. Let's, let's, hey, John Shelter, New Directions, if you come to Humboldt, you need to hook up with him. And they did. And they found out what we did and everything. Then they came here and basically, yeah. And I went, well, you guys pay people to walk on the side of the freeway and you do pay them $15 an hour, which is more than I can pay. And I said, $15 an hour to walk on the side of the highway with the grabbers and buckets. And you pick up trash, you know, maybe 15 hours a week. And I guess that's good, but where are the transferable skills? And I'm told now that they go through classes and stuff like that. Well, I don't know if any of the homeless I work with are going to go to classes. It's mostly hands-on training. You know, we teach the same kind of skill level, but we do it in the field. You know, compassion, hope. Um, those are the big factors. The biggest one is the teamwork. Learning to rely on another person helps these individuals just expand. They want to start helping more people. They want to go tell their friends, hey, you, need, you know what we're doing? Check this out. You know, I have a list of right now 15 other people that want to join me in New Directions. And I can't fathom i can't do that by myself but if i just had one city to say hey you know what we want to do your way i have had a city that said hey we're going to hire you and you're going to do this and i was all excited all right one city stepped up and said we're going to do this and then they started telling me what to do and i went well wait a minute if you knew what to do why aren't you doing it yeah why am i here why am i here well, we need somebody to pick up the trash. I'm going, mm, you know what? Y you misjudged me. Yeah, I like picking up trash and I love the environment, but it's the option, the ability to meet the homeless individuals where they're at. I go, do you know just coming in as a goon squad and cleaning up stuff after somebody's talked to somebody and chased them away is not good. That puts me in liability issues of taking somebody's personal property. So basically... We go into homeless encampments because I want to meet them. I want them to know who they are. I want to know what the trash is. I don't want to take somebody's personal property. That's bad, especially when somebody's in survival mode. Do they have any recourse if you do take their personal property and accidentally throw yeah, it? Yeah, you, you have major attorneys. There's an attorney here in, in over on 3rd Street that would defend a, a person either. But what's the chances? You know, if you're you're a homeless person, you're being chased around already, and now you're contemplating a lawsuit against the city and law enforcement because they took your stuff. Yeah, what's your chances? Yeah, and even if you get the lawyer, what are the chances of actually winning? Or being able to stay around and not being chased around from place to place. You know, it, I'm not going to say it's done on purpose. But if you got somebody who's got a lawsuit, you're not going to say, oh, leave them alone. They got a lawsuit against us. You're going to say, he's homeless. Just make him go away. Run you know? out of town. Eh. I, I hate saying that part, but it seems like that sometimes. Um, like I said, law enforcement right now is uh, Officer LaFrance and Officer Ross are, are two upstanding individuals that actually care about the homeless population. They actually really care. I believe that in my heart. Uh, I've seen interactions. I've heard about interactions with them. And I've heard interactions that they've had with the homeless that I haven't heard in the past. You know, So I know something is good going on. And all I can hope is that they're now instructing the other new cops that are coming on the force. 
you know, on, on this tactic of more of like killing them with kindness instead of bashing them. Have you know, you said you've been doing this for 20 years working with them? Oh, I've been doing this for probably 24 years now. 24. Have you noticed any improvement over that span from when you first started to now? Just as a whole, not obviously with what you're doing. No, the homeless population is more now than it was before. That is so more, crazy. And it's more drug induced. It's more drug induced now than it, it in the last five years, more drug induced than I've ever seen. And I've been doing this for a while. I ran a day center where the homeless came in for showers, laundry, uh, their mail service was there. We provided a hot lunch program in Arcata, right by the ballpark. It used to be called the Arcata Endeavor. And then when I became the executive director, we changed the, the whole image and we called it North Coast Resource Center because that's what it was. It was a resource center. And that's where I launched New Directions. And that was the nonprofit that you ran. That right? was the nonprofit. So I knew <clears throat> where this went. And even our administrative people were saying, well, we deserve a raise. I'm going, we're not making enough money to provide for these guys. We shouldn't be getting raises. But, you know, everybody wants more money and more money. And it's like, how much money do you want to make? You know? That's um, a loaded question. People will just keep going. Yeah. I make about $22 an hour doing what I do. All the liabilities, all that stuff. That's all I could take without taking away from the business. My guys make the beginning people start because I have only eight people. $13 an hour start, which goes up to 14 in January anyway. And I have some people that work for $15, $16 an hour. But that's all I could afford doing it by myself. You know, now we've expanded to two crews. And so we're hopefully, as soon as we get all the bugs worked out, it working more systematically. And then what will happen is we'll make more money where I can start paying people more money. If I actually had city government to say, hey, look, let this is a good foundation. Let's build on it. Well, you know what? Maybe I could afford $15 an hour, but they'd be working harder than picking up trash on the side of the highway. They'd be working with the camps on the side of the highway, which is where we should be, but they're not even allowed to go into that. We're, they're just picking up trash there. But we have camps right off the side of the highway, which aren't safe, you know? A car spinning out could kill somebody, you know, inadvertently. And you would think that those camps are the root of most of the trash. So just cleaning those up would be the most beneficial thing that you could do. Yeah. It, the the places today, we had rivers of trash. The, the paths to the, the main camps were trash. I, I call them rivers of trash because that's what it looks like. In some of my pictures that I took, you look at it and it's like, oh, look, that little stream goes to the river. You know, and you go to the river and it's like, whoa, like I said, you know, over 800 syringes today, you know, almost a little over two tons of trash. So is it your plan if the city doesn't step in, if they don't ever help you out and throw any money your way, are you just going to try to keep adding more crews and just tackle the problem yourself until Absolutely. somebody else just steps in? As we make more money, I, I guess I'm a better business person than I gave myself credit for. Um, as we create more profit margin. Um, we will start expanding even more. You know, I just bought another truck and another trailer. So we have three trucks, three trailers. We have power wagons. We have all the necessary stuff. But, you know, payroll right now can't be met like that. The insurances are high, workman's comp. You know, all the things that nonprofits don't have to pay for. You know, we have to pay for workman's comp, just like any business. You know, I have liability insurance. I carry a $2 million, $4 million pro, um, plan. So that's pretty expensive itself. You know, but I want to keep people safe and I want to do it right. And I want to keep myself safe too. So you, you carry all the insurance and stuff. So, you know, you get down at the bottom of the day and it's like, well, yeah, you know, I just spent $200 on gas. <laughs> Which doesn't help. Yeah, it doesn't help. That's right off the top every morning. Okay, here we go. You know, well, every other day. Because we travel everywhere from Redway to Garberville all the way to Trinidad. And so who is paying you? Are you being hired by private citizens, landowners? Yep. Everybody in between? Yep. Landowners, business people, uh, Humboldt County Roads, construction companies. 
I did want to ask about that because you're not just doing cleanups of the camps. You're also working construction with these crews, right? We do some construction. We did some um, teardown inside some houses uh, where the houses had to be stripped down to bare bones. And they, the construction crew hired us and we'd go in there, masks and everything, and we would tear down the walls to the just studs. You know, so that that's kind of it. And my one of my guys actually got a job with the construction company we just did on California Street. And those were two big drug houses that were totally so bad that they had to be gutted. You know, and they're Victorian, so they're really nice, but just they, thrashed. They just thrashed. So we had to pull out all the drywall, you know, all that stuff. And um the contractors work with us very well and keep us safe. You know, old houses sometimes have asbestos and stuff. So they didn't know about the tile, so they don't touch the floor, leave the floor alone, just work on the walls. We know the paint's good. <laughs> and I said, okay, no problem. That is a great tool. But we also work for casinos. Getting contracted out for those events like we you were We work for about. Cherry Heights Casino. We just got done doing two events for, for uh, Blue Lake Casino, and we're going to be doing their concert with their comedian uh, coming up on the 10th. So we... We breached that gap. We breached the gap with Humboldt County Roads. We have worked for Caltrans for about three years on certain projects until they determined homeless camps are um, hazmat. So they hire a hazmat crew from Fresno to come up here to clean up homeless encampments. That's pretty costly. Prevailing wage. Yeah, it seems like a waste of money. Seven-hour driving time when I thought we were supposed to hire people local. Wait, wait, wait. I'm local. <laughs> so it, it just doesn't happen. You know, it, it's word, you know, people say things, but we tend to be counterproductive in other ways, you know, shop local, but I oh, wait, let's go to Fresno to get an environmental group to come up here because they're hazmat certified, which there's nothing in a homeless encampment that's hazmat certified. I mean, hazmat worthy. If there was, wouldn't I be dead? I've been doing this for how long? And none of us have gotten ill, sick. Well, and it's funny that those, it's a hazmat situation, but the needles are a biohazard. I and, keep coming and back they to do not cloud that because medical field says they are not a biohazard. Yeah. Hey, get me. I, I, I sit there and try to argue with them and you, you can't beat the medical field. You just. Got to go along with it. Yeah. You go along with them because you're a bad person if you don't. You know, we're scientists and we know what we're doing. And I'm going, no, you don't. And once again, that's part of the reason why people don't like me. <laughs> yeah, that's not a popular opinion, right? I think it's growing a little bit because of the pandemic. I think people are understanding that facts and science, you know, are, have a love-hate relationship sometimes. That it's a, it's a changing field constantly. Yeah. People don't really like that. Numbers are numbers. I ran a nonprofit. Numbers are what you go by. They write you a grant. You you submit the grant with numbers. They come and check your numbers. Oh, yeah, those numbers look good. They've never walked outside the door and say, well, let's go visit some of these people that you've housed. Let's see how they're doing. You know, that doesn't happen. They just come to your office, look at your, all your figures. Oh, yeah, the numbers are all coming down. Oh, wait, you might be $5,000 less here. And what happened to that five? But wait, you just gave me $250,000 to do all this, and let me show you. Let's go for a tour. Let's look at these places. That's why I do befores and afters, because if you don't know what I just cleaned up, then showing you these beautiful pictures aren't going to do nothing. But seeing these beautiful pictures after what I just cleaned up, I got some great ones from today. I mean, it was probably a foot deep of trash. And, you know, a couple hours later, it's all gone. You know, it, it, those are the things that we should be gauging stuff on. And actual results. Actual results. Don't hang a banner in the, the main office and say, we've housed 67 people. Really? I want to know who the 67 people are, where they came from. Did they come from the homeless population? Did they come from clean and sober houses? Did they come for transitional housing, which is probably the best thing? So... If we're going to say we're going to provide housing for the homeless, then let's actually provide housing for the homeless. But it's all just a sleight of hand. 
It's housing for the homeless. And <clears throat> that person at the transitional house is considered homeless. But they've been living at the transitional house for a year. Now they get their permanent apartment. And, oh, wait, look, we just housed the homeless person. Not really. You know, and, and here again, I don't think they should be housing, direct housing homeless people from the street into an apartment with their addictions, alcoholism, and stuff like that. I think we should help them better themselves first before we give them an apartment and all those responsibilities that come with one. Because it'd be too overwhelming just thrusting them into that. Oh my God, PG&E, water. Uh, well, especially I, if you've been homeless for years, to then have to deal with all of that at one at one time would be... Yeah, even if you had that in your past life before you became homeless... There's a certain amount of survival that takes all that away from you. You know, a lot of these people are in survival mode. So you lose that learned behavior that you had before and you've created a new learned behavior. That learned behavior is survival, doing what you need to do to get by the next day. Why are most of them homeless? Is there a common theme? Is it the drug use? Is it some trauma that happens? It's it's usually one event, one major event that usually happens. It could be divorce. It could be a, a, a parent dying. It could be a child dying. It could be uh, drugs. It could be mental health glitch at one point. It could be a number of different things. No, I have not seen anything where you can say, oh, most of these people are homeless because of drug addiction. Well, you know, yeah, they have drug addiction now. But why did they become homeless? They became homeless because their wife died and they had nobody else. Or uh, the parents abused them and they ran away to become homeless. You know, these are all scenarios. Not any one person is the same. You know, and we kind of want to start finding that commonality that makes us feel better. Because it's easier that way. Yes. If there's one common thread because then you can point to that and say, oh, as long as I don't do that, it won't or happen to me. it's better for them to try to find a solution for that one thing than versus, all of these problems. Versus trying to figure out something that's going to encompass all this. And, and that's my biggest pet peeve is that you're trying to roll this into, oh, they're all drug addicted. Well, yeah, they are now. And you know, if I lived out here for three years, I probably would be too. Because there is a code of ethics out here. And if you're not getting high with them, then you're against them. You know, because cop will roll in and, oh, you narked me off. Da, 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 da. You know, so it, it, it's really hard um, to pinpoint any one aspect. There is a commonality that they've all lost hope and faith. That's the one thing that I have seen. Is that because they feel left behind or they just they're so sunken into this place where they don't see a way out? That the mental health condition, exposure to the elements when you're not really want to be. So even though you may have lived in a house for 10 years, you know, married, having a good your wife died. All of a sudden you just lose your job. You know, you just lose it. So you lose your job. You now lost your place. Live. You're out here in the whole outside not knowing really how to deal with being homeless. So you have an exposure to the elements for one, which I've seen depression, anxiety created just from that at our center. When I had the center, you'd see people come in that would just become homeless and you could see the anxiety and depression leave when they found a place where they knew they can come every single day and take care of going to the bathroom, taking a shower, contributing we had lines of people at our door because seven o'clock in the morning when we opened, they knew that the bo that we took on volunteers and volunteers at the end of the night, simply what they got was extra food to take home with them. You know, that's all. But you got to come in and help the other homeless individuals navigate the system, the shower system, the laundry system, the phone system, the mail system. You know, it, it does take a lot to feel like you know where you want to be and to feel of service. I think that that that's is an important the big one value. That's where new direction is a real pivotal part because you're, you're valued. 
We got people driving by saying, thank you guys. That, uh, these guys, they never heard that before. And somebody's depending on you. You're working in that team environment. Yep. You have to look out for the guy next to you and they're looking out for you and you're helping each other to pack out this trash or yeah. strip down this house. And then when you're done with the job, you're looking back at it and going, wow, we did that. And the contractor's going, yeah, you guys did. Here, here's an extra $40. I'm giving you guys tips. It's like, these guys have never experienced that before. You know, putting them in a position where they can be appreciated, where they can actually benefit the community. Like my guy said, you know, one guy says, I've taken away from the community for so long. Here's my chance to give back. And I'm going, wow, I'm glad. Thank you. <laughs> I didn't know I was that important, but if that's how you feel. Cool. Let's go. You know, um, I'm really a nice guy. I don't know why people are so afraid of me, you know, from the upper level, but, um, the homeless aren't afraid of me and the business owners aren't afraid of me. Um, the private landowners aren't afraid of me. And, but somehow I feel the politicians are. Well, I think it's the waves. Right. You're if you're actually helping to solve the problem, you're creating waves and people do not like it when you rock the boat because that creates problems for them, especially the higher up the chain you go. Yeah, I do a lot of social media and, and when I put stuff out there, nobody's ever called me a liar or a, I'm fabricating or anything. I put out facts and then I base it with pictures and stuff so you can actually see the facts and they're going, well, that's not what we were told. And I said, well, go back to who you ever told that and said they were wrong, you know, and, and people, city management gets beat up a lot because of that, because, well, they said that couldn't be done and nobody could do that. And I'm going, well, I did. I'm nobody. You know, they could have done it too. And you have the proof. You have the pictures. I have the pictures. So I base everything. It's like when they said, oh yeah, well, you know, you don't weren't really out there before the trail system. I'll go, Really? Here, let me show you. And I have catalogs and catalogs of these pictures, you know, from way back, you know, um, before the trail system was actually built. It was like, yeah, that's me. Look at these shopping carts. There's one picture we probably had like 500 shopping carts out in the parking lot at uh, the Bayshore Mall because our dumpster was full. And I stood up on top of the thing and took a picture down. Great picture that supposedly didn't exist, but wait. Uh, this picture exists. You know? I've got it right here. I got it right here. It's just like all those pictures of murals, all the pictures of, of these encampments that I do. I don't really do it to make the homeless person look bad. I do it to make our community feel bad. These people have been out of sight, out of mind, because that's what we wanted them. This is what was created with out of sight, out of mind. I don't mind them being out of sight can't ever let them be out of mind we can't just ever let them be back here no trash disposal no bathrooms what did you expect to happen they're not just going to go away they found a safe place and nobody's bothering them yeah why leave yeah unfortunately what happens even in the best situations other people find out they're camping there and they move in into that area and they overwhelm the individuals that were there in the first place and then pretty soon, it's just a big mess. So in terms of the drug use, because that seems like that is a big factor here as well, is that coming after becoming homeless? So the stage one is you become homeless and then the drug use, or does it normally recur the other way around? Uh, that one, uh, uh, that one, people have become homeless because of drug addiction, because of alcoholism, you know, for those things, not along with the divorce and death and stuff like that. But once you become homeless, when you're out here for a longer period of time, there's a certain code of ethics. Yeah, that's what you said that kind of yeah. piqued my interest. And, and that's the part where if you're not addicted at one point, you will be if you stay out here too long. Um, you can only isolate yourself away from people. And now the homeless population is growing it's not shrinking and basically you can't stay away from a homeless person you're going to come in contact with a homeless person someplace especially if you're another homeless person so it, it's 
it, it's really like a catch 22 just the whole thing it's like did they did the chicken cross the road to get the hey, which one was born first or, it's the same thing it's the problem is is where they're at right then and yes they probably have an addiction i haven't met too many of them that don't have an addiction at first or they're dabbling with it if you catch them fast enough then they're not addicted you know they're just playing around with it because they have to or they want to or um well i got nothing else to do with my life you know kind of a thing if you can stabilize them and get them comfortable get them a place where they know they're safe does that addiction normally subside or is it a little harder to get rid of that even if even I if say you get 80% them on the feet. of the population would it would subside 80% 80% there is 20% that's just going to do the passive aggressive behavior oh just yeah do I drugs got a safe they place to do, to do it and I'm just going to do drugs yeah. but what if we had the concept where we actually believed that their tent was their home and i have friends that actually drink before they go home to their family and kids to have dinner they go to stop off at the bar to have a drink with the buddies yo why am i gonna see this is the problem that i have i i think like real people it's like this tent is your home and what you do inside your tent is your business if you come out into the community and you cause a disruptance and you're high and stuff now you've caused a problem but i'm not going to tell you I wouldn't tell you what to do in your house. And if this tent is the only housing they have, then why can't we look at it that way? You know, okay, you're staying in your tent. So if I created a campground and, you know, oh, can't smoke weed here or anything, but what if they did? What if after work, they got done work, they had a beer and smoked a joint and they stayed in their tent and went to sleep and they got up in the morning and went to work. Do we really have a problem? I don't think so. You know, is it teaching them, uh, you know, I'm, I'm still trying to quit smoking. It's the hardest thing I've ever tried to quit in my life. You know, I have a past also, you know. I was homeless at a, one period of time back in the mid-80s. Actually, before the mid-80s, probably the early 80s. But there, there's... We we have to start looking at people, and if we want them to believe that we respect them, then we have to show some type of respect. If I created a campground that had 15 tents in it, and they're all working and stuff for a living and stuff and trying to earn enough money to move up to another level, you know, maybe Betty's Container Village or something like that, it's like, why wouldn't you give them that little space? Why would you say, oh, abstinence only? which is what most people want from the upper government. It's like, is it really that bad? You know, uh, I don't drink or smoke pot or anything, but I do smoke cigarettes and drink a lot of coffee. You know, are you going to tell me I can't do that in my house? Well, the distinction that we draw is weird, right? Because like you said, we allow alcohol, which is a drug. We allow caffeine, which is a drug. We now allow weed. But then we say, okay, no Coke or no heroin or no these other things. And I think it's because you it's easier to track bad examples with those ones. And we just look at that and say, okay, this is where we're going to draw that line. Yeah. We're going to be okay with these ones because they're more socially acceptable. More people do them. More people are currently using them. So, And if you use these ones, you're probably going to be able to keep your life on the straight track, which I don't think fully tracks because there are people that do, that drink I, themselves to death. There's not too many people that work for me that have tried to do IV use kept on going or meth. Uh, those are the two prime examples. They, they usually bow out quick. They, they, they can't handle it. So I don't think we actually have to worry about them doing that in their tents. It's mostly the alcohol, smoking cigarettes, the Which is pot. what everybody's already doing. Yes, they're already doing it. But now because you're homeless and we're giving you this tent, we're telling you you can't. Well, I think it's because the line of thinking is that you have done something wrong to get where you are. So now somebody else has to step in yeah. 
and guide your life because you have proven in some way that you can't be responsible for yourself. Right. And that's the biggest crap shoot I've ever heard because that is what a lot of people say. And sometimes, you know, the same reason why we can't figure out one specific thing is because maybe this was uninvertible, you know, inevitable. You unavoidable. Unavoidable. Excuse me. I make up my own words. I sometimes. do that all yeah. the time on here. <laughs> Welcome to the club. But, um, you know, it, it's sometimes things happen. You know, they just don't like, I'm going to wake up this morning. I'm going to be a drug addict. No, that doesn't always happen like that. Sometimes it's a simple experiment, a kid experimenting with drugs that gets hooked on stuff. You know, it, we used to think that before with kids, but we can't foresee that with a homeless person because we have to fix that homeless person because they're broke. Well, maybe they're not broke. Maybe they're just worn down and we just have to shine them up a little bit. You know, I've actually proved that it works, but we still want to think that they're broke. I've never met a person that was broke except for the extremely mentally ill one that's broke. The other ones all have had choices and have done their own choices. Um, nobody's forcing somebody to shove a needle in their arm, you know? And then, yeah, it's 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 a really weird situation. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Does mental illness follow the same path? Where if you're not mentally ill before you become homeless, you're probably going to develop something in that environment? Well, that's the exposure part, the loss of hope and faith and and not really knowing how to navigate the water, waters of being homeless. That could create anxiety and depression, which could lead into other forms of mental illness. Um, if nothing else, anxiety and depression is pretty bad by itself. What about more extreme cases like schizophrenia is that i've common? seen uh induced schizophrenia from drugs um i i've had employees that have been schizophrenic i've never seen i i've had this one young lady that's to me was the most amazing person i've ever met and she worked for me and i've learned so much about schizophrenia from her but also the fact of trying to figure out how she controls it so much. Because you've seen other people walking down the road screaming, yelling at their head, talking to themselves. But this young lady who had the extreme case was able to control, you know, and but she said she had it from a very young age, you know, and then she grew up with it through the years and learned how to deal with it versus just going crazy. She actually can relate to a lot of the, the individuals we have in the Valley West Shopping Center. We have a couple of women there that are totally schizophrenic and and they're just yelling and screaming and stuff. But, you know, we'll walk up and she'll start talking with them and everything calms down. How do you help the ones that are, I don't know if you would say too far gone, but are just way down the rabbit hole, especially with schizophrenia? Because you can't just put them, obviously, in a housing unit by themselves because it's just going to, be a disaster me myself i can't fix anybody like that you know um if they're too far down with drugs and mental illness you basically there's not much i can do about it um is there anything they anyone don't, can do they don't sting well you would hope as much money as we dump into mental health and and but do we have anything that. that's tangible that is actually helping them in your opinion or no they're just kind of left out there i i can't answer that because i don't know everything but there sure is a lot of them walking around that should be swooped up and helped but because legal rights the person has the, the right to kill themselves and destroy themselves i guess i don't know why why are these individuals that can't care for themselves that can barely dress that are matted and and their fingernails are so long and and they're just why are they why are they still walking around the roads? Why haven't we swooped them up and put them in a place where they can benefit? I don't I know think the answer. I think it's because of the insane asylum aspect of our history. I think we were too far on one side where we just scooped everybody up and treated them like shit. The pendulum. Yeah, and now we're too far to the, the left pendulum. where we don't help anybody. I love it. Uh, I guess cuz I'm a Libra, 
I, I always thought about this this pendulum. It's either we go fully extreme or not. Mm-hmm. We never get to that middle part where we stop. You know, the meet up middle ground. It's either everything or nothing. I don't get it. You know, there's so many people out there, and I know we go back to Ronald Reagan kicking everybody out of the mental health hospitals, which really happened. But that also created a set of rules where you can't confine anybody. But to my last knowledge, suicide is against the law. I, I thought, isn't suicide against the law? You're not supposed to kill yourself? I mean, I'm not sure how they do anything. I don't about know. It, I know but... some states you can do assisted suicide, but I think it has to be for medical. Yeah. I just don't understand reason. why these individuals are walking the street when basically they just cause a major disturbance. They usually end up walking out into traffic. They. Uh... It's just a bad situation. Yeah. And I don't have an answer for it. I mean, I'm not trying. I just, I scratch my head like everybody else does. Like, why are they out here? They, they can't take care of themselves. They're going to die. They, they are dying. You know, you could see it. There's a, a one gentleman that has this long red hair that looks pretty much dead. I've seen him a couple times. Yeah. I see him pretty much everywhere I go. And, and uh, it, it's like, why? Why is he still out here? Why have uh, these other people... You know, we have the same young ladies over there in um, Valley West area. They can't take care of themselves. They're running around half naked. Um, uh, yeah. It, How are these people getting by? Is it is it panhandling? Is it just eating out of the trash? Finding food wherever you can? But Finding food wherever you can. Stealing. Stealing. Is that a um, big one? Yeah. Uh, I got to admit that it is a big one. I mean, a lot of stuff that I find in homeless encampments have been taken from someplace they could have taken them from alleys that somebody discarded i don't know but sometimes when you run across a brand new barbecue you kind of go okay i don't get that one um you you know it came from somewhere did they hit the jackpot a lucky lotto ticket or something and then say yeah, i'm gonna go buy a barbecue i ain't got no food to cook on it yeah. but you know it'll be nice to have yeah decorative so yeah i i think a lot is like once again survival you know, if I didn't eat for a day or so, I'd probably walk into Walmart and see if I could steal a, a, a bag of or a package of meat and stuff or cheese. You know, I would. If I was freezing at night, uh, I'd probably run into TJ Maxx and run out the door with a blanket. You know, it happens all the time. Um, when they first did the raids out in Devil's Playground... Um, you know who got hit the hardest with that was Sears and Walmart. The homeless would say, oh, you took my stuff. I'm just going to run in here, get another sleeping bag, run out the door. And the security doesn't do anything. Yeah, especially at Ross. Yeah. 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 It, it's, it's, we have to do something different if we want something different to happen. That's the key. And, and we currently just want to do the same thing over and again. And I keep on saying it, man, you just repackage the old ideas, have somebody else sell it, and you say, oh, look, this is it. But it's still the same old idea, just repackaged. It's not new. You know, a campground is new. Let's try it. Let's see if it works. I have a pretty good uh, success rate with what I try. You know, I've tried a few different things. I mean, we had a, a problem in Garberville and Redway where they had uh, small cooking fires. You know, and people were worried, oh, my God, it's going to burn everything down. I said, well, I got a suggestion. I went out there, and thanks to Facebook and stuff, I got some donations for uh, – I bought single burner stoves and rechargeable propanes. So all the people that we were working with in all these campsites, I said, oh, look, you stop doing the cooking fires, I give you one of these. Each week I come back, I'll bring you a couple more cylinders. You save me the old ones, we'll refill them. And guess what? The eight camps that I was working, eight out of nine camps that I worked with, be truthful, were using them. The one camp didn't really give a shit. They had bonfires and everything. But, you know, I, I, I really want to be true. I tried it with nine camps. It worked with eight. That's a pretty good success rate. Yeah. They, they no longer did cooking fires. They used the propane stove. You know, well, that means you're making them stay there. No, I'm stopping them from building a fire. Do you get that pushback a lot, though, where if you do provide these services, if you do the trash pickup, 
you're just you're incentivizing them to stay put in these areas where they're not supposed to be. Yeah, I get that pushback sometimes. And then I explain to people, it's like, well, where do you want them to go? If I know where they're at and I'm working with them, isn't that a good place? And they go, well, yeah, I didn't think about that. It's like, well, yeah, that means they're supervised, huh? You know, and well, yeah, kind of. That's the whole thing, you know. Out of sight, out of mind, I I can't say it enough how much of a failure that was. You know, we should not have these guys out of sight, out of mind. Maybe out of sight. We we can put them someplace in a nice little green area, not on a parking lot. You know, we, we can't do a temporary campground on a parking lot. That means this is just transitional and we have to do it. So we didn't give it any thought. Here's a parking lot you can be in. I think Arcata did that. Yeah. Yeah. But the best thing about that one, after a year and a half, they thought of no other way to keep it going. In other words, they created this thing and I was applauding it. And then I was going, well, when the money runs out, what are you going to do? Is this the one out by the the rec center and the health sport out there? No, this was the one that they established right there over on G Street and behind the transit station. Oh, I don't think I've heard Th- of that those one. Those two were made by Arcata um, House Partnership. And the biggest fault I had with that is that there was no thinking about, okay, well, we were able to do this. We pulled it off. Well, how are we going to keep it going? When the money ran out, so did the homeless. And um, we did that same thing with room key, with the motel rooms that for, for homeless with potentially going to get COVID instead of getting them into these motel rooms and then transition them into their apartments. They had them in motel rooms, right? So let's take one situation in Garberville. They had 10 motel rooms. They had 10 homeless people in there. They stayed in there for a year and a half. Well, why didn't you take those 10 people and get them into apartments like you're supposed to and then move more homeless people into these apartments? Basic transition. I don't know why that was. Um, was it easier just to keep the same 10 nice people in the apartment so I didn't have to deal with it? Yeah. Well, then what's the plan there? Do you just keep them in the motel or what? Yeah, until the money again? ran out. And then they're homeless again. Yes, ma'am. They And the reason why I say ma'am is because in Garberville and Redway, there was four women that when the money ran out, became homeless again. And one woman had a hip like minded before I got a replacement and she could barely walk. But we did nothing when they were in the motel rooms for a year and a half with them. We didn't transition, you know, which is what we're supposed to be doing. Housing first, remember? And I'm not seeing it happen. And you were halfway there. You got them off the street. You got them off the street. You got them in a motel room. And then you left them there. Meanwhile, all these other homeless people could have been going back in there too. And we could have been moving more people in. But the biggest thing is, is that if people are getting so much money for housing first, but there's no housing, where's the money going? Then to somebody's pocket. I don't know that for a fact, but if you're, if you got money for housing, which we know millions and millions of dollars come into Humboldt County, to provide housing for the homeless. And the best you can come up with is buying a couple motels and trying to change them over to permanent supportive housing. But it's like um, working with these nonprofits and it's like, hey, I got a couple people in your, your RV place. They're both working full time now. They got work histories of a couple months. You got deposit money and, and rent money. Oh, yeah. But we we don't find places. So where does the money go? Yeah, there was something shady. And I haven't gotten to the bottom of it yet. But with the homeless housing in those those motels in Humboldt County, throughout Humboldt. Uh, that's come up a few times now on the podcast. Yeah, the the motels, I guess it's a great idea. You're taking these motels and... And turning them into single occupancy rooms. Um, I applaud it if you can get it done and actually go for 
Who? Who's going in these places? You know, we just had that place on 5th Street. What is it called? Humboldt Inn or something like that. It used to be the Budget Inn, and it was condemned. And they took it out, and they created a new place that was supposed to help the homeless get in and stuff. And now they've just gutted the whole thing again and started rebuilding it again. That wasn't built very long ago, rebuilt. So what's the story? You know, I, there's a lot of money into building stuff um, where I think we need to back off and start looking at how to engage. That's the biggest thing. I do like your idea of that transitional that transitional stage before you put them in permanent housing. Yeah. I think that would that has the potential to to make an impact. I I think transition is uh, the key here. Transitioning but not transitioning not going all the way <sighs> yeah. right out of the gate. Yeah, we don't have to 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 control people to make them better. I don't control my workers. I give them options and they have the options to do what they want to do. You know, they don't want to go to work. They don't have to go to work. But you know what? You do that too many times. You know what's going to happen. You know, I don't fire people. I guess I make them feel bad enough to where they want to just leave because they feel like they've let everybody down on the team. And that's good because you're in touch with your feelings. I always say you got to pull their heart out, throw it on the ground, stomp on it to get it beaten again, then put it back in their chest. You know, and, and people laugh. Huh? And I'm going, no, what I meant is you got to get their heart going again. They don't have faith. They don't have hope that anybody's really listening to them. We create for people. We're not asking them, hey, what can I do for you to help you? I got a list of papers that here, it's a bunch of housing and a bunch of detox places and clean and sober housing. Here, read this. See where you want to go. Huh? What? No. I'm not doing that. And see what you have to give up to get yeah. there. In Garberville and Redway, it was very interesting. We've been working with a bunch of camps and I guess law enforcement, and the, the city people wanted to go into the camps and see what's going on and stuff. And the cops came in and took photographs of them, said, you're a potential trespasser and I'm taking your picture. It made them sit there and take like mug shots. Then gave them... Then, after that said, oh, yeah, by the way, I brought these people in to help you from Housing First people. And they came in and gave them literature about where to go to get RV parks and stuff like that. None of them were in Redway or Garberville. They were all in Eureka, Fortuna, Arcata. I actually have one of the papers out in my truck still. I carry it with me all the time. Well, and how are they supposed to get there? How does that make sense? Yes. Isn't that a good question? Because they weren't providing transportation. They were just telling you where they go. This is after the law enforcement officer told them that they were criminal, potential criminal trespassing. Yeah, opening up with that doesn't seem No, doesn't seem great. as you, you, After that, they shut off. The homeless people weren't listening to you after that. Oh, yeah, you just told me that and took my mug shot, and now these people are supposed to help me? How much trust is in there? Not much. Do you mind if I ask how you became homeless? Yeah, through a divorce. That was... I was a divorce and my wife um, kidnapped my children from me and put them in hiding. And that broke me. Um, she also called my work and told them I was a drug addict and my work fired me. This was all on my birthday. September 28th. I remember that one. And um, all hit me at one time. I got hit with a restraining order at work. Then my boss called me in and fired me. Couldn't go back to the house. I basically had my car. And then um, I fought hard. Went to court appearances and stuff like that. And won rights to my daughters, seeing my daughters again. And then rebuilt my life. You have to have a higher power. Higher power in my case was not just God, but was my children. Why did your wife do that? Why? Um, <laughs> um, uh, to this day, I don't have very male, much, many male best friends. And there's a reason for that. Oh, no. So, um, 
that had happened to me twice. With with the same girl. Uh, yeah, I I remarried her again when we moved up here away from all the bad stuff. Unfortunately, she didn't tell me the bad stuff followed her up here, and that was the end of that one again. Um. The, what broke me is actually taking my kids away and putting them in hiding. I think I could have dealt with everything else. Um, my children were always the most. Uh, even when I was homeless, my kids now, you could even tell them, uh, they never knew I was homeless. We went camping every time dad was visiting. So we went to Willow Creek. We went to Trinidad. We went to Patrick's Point, down south, uh, Swimmer's Delight, you know. Um, they never knew I was homeless because they only see me on the weekends. And then, um, that all changed. Um, I got a nice job helping people. Redwood Community Action Agency. That's what pulled you out. Yeah. They, they saw something in me that I didn't see in myself and put me behind a desk working with the homeless population. And I've been there ever since. That was late seventies. How long were you homeless for? Not long. Uh, I lived in my van. Um, probably about six months, eight months, something like that. That is crazy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It is crazy. It was a crazy life of my thing. Searching places. I actually bought a motorcycle so people wouldn't see my van. Because it was bright orange. <laughs> oh, so you would just live in your van and then go drive around. I, I with the bought bike. a small motorcycle, and uh, or g- actually given a small motorcycle for what I paid for it, and um, I drive that around that way because my daughter, who was a little bit older, my oldest daughter Victoria, she would call me every once in a while when she had a chance to call me and say, "Dad, you know, you got to come and find us. We're over here." But you know, she was six years old at that point. No, eight years old. My other daughter was six. So, um, yeah, it was quite an interesting life. But she was telling me that mom told them to play hide and seek if you seen the orange van to hide. So I couldn't see, be seen. Because I knew places they could be and everything. But I just didn't know where, where they were. Yeah, that's... I, yeah, that's... <laughs> it, that's why... Uh, my one driver now, my new guy, Cam, him and his daughter brought back so many old memories. It's like, yeah, I'll tow you to this place myself. Here, let me go get my other truck. <laughs> um, and now he's got his kid in daycare. Um, he's moving up. You know, he's he wants to get an apartment now. Before, when I first met him, it's like, I'm fine the way I am and everything. But now he's been over and visited me at my house and stuff and interacted with my family. And now he's like, oh, okay, I remember, you know, and so now his goal is to get an apartment. So that's what we're helping him on now. Did you have any, any savings for like food and stuff that you were doing or how were you, how were you getting by those six months? Food banks. Um, didn't really have to panhandle. I mean, things didn't cost as much back then. Uh, the KOA campground was still going at that point and they charged me $8.95 for a primitive camp spot and they knew that, you know, who I was. Well, at that time, I was just a homeless person in a van. Um, And then um, that worked out really well until like the last two months and then somebody called child welfare because they thought that a man living in a van with two kids wasn't a good idea. Because I could be bad. I'd still like to find that person. <laughs> but that um, that promoted everybody to start putting other things. Uh, I mean, that's how I got involved with uh, Redwood Community Action Agency. You know, I was actually said, hey, you know, you should try to go get a motel room with these guys. And then I started talking to a woman named Simone Taylor, which is still an angel that... um. Seen a lot more in me than I see on myself. That's for sure. Sent me back to school, become a substance abuse counselor. You know, <laughs> made me go to school to first become a substance abuse counselor. So, yeah, that's my story. It's not much compared to a lot of these other people. But it's still your story. Still my story. How did you find 
um, the Redwood Coast Agency. Redwood Coast Community Red, Action Agency? Can, yeah. Um, through law enforcement and child welfare? They, As a resource, they kind of pointed you towards them? Yeah. They, they basically wanted me to get a motel room, basically, and get out of the van. And I said, well, I'll give it a shot. You know, and that it worked out. It worked out the best thing that possibly could have probably happened. Then I started, um, before that, when we first moved up here, I was a cook. I owned a restaurant called Belly Busters. That's when I first moved up here. I took my life savings and my kids because I had both of my kids at that point. And um, I won custody of them. <clears throat> and we moved up here. And that was, I had um, right on G and 14th in Arcata called Belly Busters and build your own hamburgers and stuff. That was a real good experience. It lasted for a couple years. And then she took off with the kids and I lost it again. It's, it's scary how easily your life can be turned upside down and by no fault of your own. People just don't understand that. You know, divorce is a two-way thing. You know, I, I'm sure I did a lot of things that wasn't supposed to happen either. Uh, back then, we dabbled in drugs. You know, I'm not a, I'm not going to say I was an angel. I did my share of coke and meth and stuff like that. Um, never heroin. I never really seen the, the need for downers. You know, who wants to be down, you know? But um, some people do. But, um, yeah, I... I haven't talked about my history in quite a while. <laughs> yeah, I just, it's, was she, was she doing drugs as well? Cause... Yeah, we were both doing drugs okay. together. So it wasn't like she was taking the kids to try to take them to a better situation. No, no. She we, was just We were both doing drugs and she hooked up with my best friend and basically I was expendable. Okay. Those are like the two worst things that can happen is your kids are taken from you and your wife is cheating on you. Yeah. Uh, and then you're homeless now. Yeah. Like, <laughs> and you lost your job. And, and you lost your it, job. Yeah. It's like getting crushed. Yeah. And you go from being a small business owner to being homeless. Yeah. And But look at you now. And, and back down in Southern California in Southgate, I was a metallurgist. So I studied metal for the aerospace industry at a very young age. Um, I made back then forty five, fifty thousand dollars a year was really or good a money. A lot of money, yeah. That was good money back in the seventies. And um I gave that up just to get away from after I got my kids back after she took off the first time. I got I had to fight with attorneys and stuff to get my kids back. And as soon as I got my kids back, I moved and we came up here to Humboldt County. What were you thinking those first few weeks? Were you just spot? Because I'm thinking if if I was in your place, I don't know how I would have been able to pull myself back. Which part? When when you find out and you realize the first day that you're now homeless, that you don't have your kids. I sat on the curb and cried. Flat out, I remember that. I sat there and said, what the hell do I do? I got no food. They just gave me my last check, so I do have money on me. You know, but I have to go to the bank to cash it. Um, I have no place to go. I can't see my kids. I was told I'm not allowed to see my kids. You know, because back then in the 70s, also, whatever a woman said was right. Which, the 70s, I'm sure it was way worse, but that is still a legitimate concern today. Yeah, but back then, it was like, it doesn't matter what they say or what they're doing. They can look with zits all over their face and, and scratching like this. And you're a good mom. Um, I remember when, um, through the whole process of starting to work at Redwood Community Action to see I had one child and she had one child. And that's what the court decided was okay because my oldest daughter wanted to come live with me. And the youngest one wanted to stay with mom, which was fine. Um, but I had to pay child support and she didn't. So I went to court. I actually filed an appeal and went to court and said, well, you know, we each have a kid. So can we just stop this? Because I'm disabled right now and I don't have the money and you're taking out money. that could... The judge looked at me and said, well, why are you punishing your daughter? Give her back to the mother. And I said, well, thank you very much, Your Honor. Grabbed my daughter and we walked out. And I dealt with it. 
I actually had a judge say that. He's passed away now, Morrison, but that's okay. It's a broken system when it comes to children and, and divorces especially. Yeah, it is. Uh, I'm raising my granddaughter right now. My wife's daughter gave birth and then took off, and she's pretty much like any of these other people I'm working with right now. And she's in Reading or someplace like that. And hasn't seen her daughter for probably seven years. She just turned 10. Do you attribute your ability to come back? Do you attribute that to your kids? Yeah. To having something to, to fight for? They were my higher power. Um, I do believe in God, but I just don't push it. And um, I will tell everybody my highest power is my kids. Uh, without them... I probably wouldn't have made it back. But my fight to see them again, my fight to be in their life again, nobody was going to take that away from me. And I made sure it didn't happen. And look at you now. Yeah, I'm okay. I got to get better. <laughs> That's a good, that is a good <laughs> thing to say because we can all get better. But Every I mean, you, you set the example for, hey, this thing happened to you and it's rough right now. But you can get back. There's always a way back. You just have to you just have to fight for it. And some fights are gonna be harder than others, but you can make your way back. How bad do you want it? Do you have that higher power? Do you have a reason to do this? You know, if you sit there and look at me and go, I have no reason to get sober or want to work or anything, well, there's not much I can do for you then. But if you like, well, I'd like to see my daughter again and, and maybe live inside a house again. Well, damn it, we can do that. Let, let's put it to work. Do you notice that with the guys that successfully m move on from being homeless or join your crew, they're the ones that have something to fight for? Yeah, it, it, once again, it goes back to that 80% kind of thing. 20% just are tired of being down and just want something else to do and you know, and having faith or trust in something to try to do something. 80%, yeah, they, they, they pretty much want to get something back. They want to reunite with their family. They'd like to see their kid again, but they'd like their kid to see him a lot better than the last time they seen him. You know, and I said, well, you know, let's do that. Then maybe we get you a bus ticket, you go visit them. But let's establish the relationship again. Let's make phone calls. I, I always buy my guys a phone. You know, they can get the Obama phones or whatever you want to call them in the little shack things. But, you know, to walk into the store and buy them a hundred dollar phone with a card, you know, um, means something to them. Like, wow, I can actually do FaceTime with them and stuff. And I go, yeah, you can. That phone is freedom nowadays. Yeah. I still trying to piece together why they decided to give out free phones. I didn't know they were doing that. Yeah, they do. They they call them Obama phones or whatever. But there's like these like little tent things that like they have it over by Jack in the Box or uh, sometimes they have it by the mall. They have it at Valley West and they give out free phones. Um, actually, the gas station right there on um, um, Broadway and Woodruff or oh, I forgot the name of the street. But anyway, there's a, a Patriot right there and they'll set up right there on the corner, too. And as long as you have um, a food stamp card or a social security card, not a social security card, but a disabled card, you can actually get a free phone. And I'm going, man, you know, the one thing that I've always wanted to do was put a tracking device on the homeless to see the migration, where they go. Because California, you have a lot of festivals, well, used to before the pandemic, had festivals all the way from San Diego all the way to Washington State. You know, you had the Grateful Dead tours. You had all kinds of festivals. Uh, the Kate Wolf, Wolf one down there and stuff. And I'd like to see where they all go. Because you have your traveling homeless, too. You know, that just... Is that a big population of... It used to be. But since the pandemic, it's slowed down quite a bit. Um, yeah, I've seen a big drop in that. Because we've been working the 20... We worked through the pandemic and stuff. And... um. We actually were essential services for the homeless population by the sheriff, which I tip my hat to him, thank him. But um, 
yeah, I it, it slowed down a lot. The pandemic slowed everybody down. You create fear, and and pretty much everybody will do anything you want to do when you create fear, and that's basically what happened. Are you guys back up and running? full speed now oh i've i've just expanded yeah i went from one crew to down we have two crews and if everything goes right next spring we'll start a third one um like i said if i have to do it myself i will i believe you <laughs> i believe you <laughs> well john we can wrap this up we've been here for two hours i know oh, you're kidding? probably a busy man yeah <laughs> no, we've been, have we, we really been talking for two yeah. hours yeah we were putting in some work holy cow i know so we'll let you get out of here uh, you're a powerful man. I really appreciate you you coming on and talking with me. I really enjoyed that. I thank you for letting me be heard. Yeah. That, that's the biggest thing is being heard for a change. Um, at this level, I don't know. You'll have to send me a link or something where people can tap into it because, man, I want to put this on Facebook. So, okay, you guys, you never had a chance to listen to me or have a talk with me. Listen to this. You know, um, this was kind of real. So I thank you very much for just getting that story out. Yeah, I appreciate you you sharing it. I think it's an important side of the story that doesn't get told. And you, I mean, you have a great message behind it. And you're clearly, you're out here doing the Lord's work. You know, you're, thank you, you got your boots on the ground. Do you want to plug where people can find you, where they can find New Directions, donate if they want to donate? Do you have anything like well, that set up? people, that's the big thing with me, it being a social enterprise versus a nonprofit um, and you got to look that up. You told me you didn't know about yeah, it. Yeah, I will. So you look up a social enterprise, which is a combination of the two. Unfortunately, the government only sees me as a business. So making donations, what it is is if you want to help support New Directions, you call 707-616-1182 and you give us work. Give us work so I can hire the homeless to make our communities better. You got to change the attitudes before you can change the behaviors. There you go. That's it. All right, John, thank you. <laughs> Two hours, really? I know.